There are tickets, obviously, available. We want to sell 300. I don't know what number we're up to. Lindy, any idea of how many we've sold? <laughs> okay. Yeah, fair enough. Because the Signet Theatre offers it at a reasonable price if we have a certain number of people. So, And it's six till eight, isn't it? So it's not a bad time frame, next Sunday night. Anyone going? Anyone praying about going? Bring a friend, yeah. Okay, also our offering this morning for missions, if the guys could just quickly whip that round. This is not to pressure people or embarrass anyone, but every third s- Sunday we take an offering for the support of the six, th- uh, six major mission projects. If the ushers could quickly do that, that would be great. Genesis chapter 7 this morning, why don't we just uh, have a look at that and let's go as far as the Lord can lead us this morning. Okay, Genesis chapter 7, verse 11 and 12. Genesis 7, 11 and 12. Now my eyes will be reasonably well focused this morning but I left my glasses down in uh, the Anglican outreach. So I hope they're blessed with it. So I've got an old pair of glasses, 15 years old, and I can make out Rob and Tracy. I'm not sure which one's Rob and which one's Tracy. Oh, Rob and Tracy. Yeah, so. so we'll see how we go. <coughs> Genesis chapter 7 gives us a picture of what happens when God moves. And because God is moving so wonderfully, always has been moving, but now it's caught up with us. Hallelujah. That Western nations have been caught up in a wonderful move of God in our time, in our generation. And according to Genesis chapter 7, a couple of things start happening when the Spirit of God starts pouring out. And we can recognise these two things in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11 and 12. Just let's come on a journey this morning and see where the Lord leads us. Genesis 7 verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Now I used this scripture a couple of Friday nights ago to speak to the uh, folk at the well that when God moves, two things simultaneously start happening and if we can recognise it, then we can begin to move with it. You know, faith comes with knowledge. If you haven't got knowledge, you sort of actually can't get into the program of God. People, it's not a blind faith that you and I move with. We move with an informed faith. Our faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when God speaks, we respond by saying, I believe it, Lord, and I'm moving with that word. Faith is not some obscure thing where we just jump out and hope something happens. That's ridiculous. Uh, we are... Uh, are framed by the word of God. Hebrews 11.3 says God frames everything by his word. Out of the chaos, out of the, out of the, um, the, the uh, Genesis chapter 1, between 1 and 2, it says the earth was without form and void, chaotic, no form, no, no shape, no substance, no order, no alignment. And then God began to speak and his word framed the world. The word framed and put into perspective everything. And so Christians live by the, the word of God. What are you saying, Lord? Because we want to move with what you're saying. We're not jumping out of windows of planes saying, I hope we go somewhere in the spirit. You'll go somewhere in the spirit, all right, and come down with a mighty thud. But what we want to do is, Lord, frame this experience by the word of God. Yeah? Frame this with the truth so that I'm always walking and being led into the truth by the Holy Spirit. So when the Lord moves... And we sang earlier, let the rain come, and we were by faith saying the rain's coming, the rain's coming. Here it says, when the rain comes, the anointing pours out of heaven, something stirs deep within, and that is the fountains of the deep begin to stir up. In other words, within your spirit and my spirit, there is a stirring of God uh, to receive the revelation that God is giving. The fountains, the word fountains, talks about the revelation of God coming forth, breaking forth, bursting forth. So when God moves, he doesn't want his church to be ignorant. He wants us to be uh, co-workers, fellow labourers, equally yoked and moving with him. Not lagging way behind, certainly not being presumptuous and saying, come on, we're doing this, God, you better bless it. None of that nonsense. But Lord, what are you saying? Lord, what are you doing? We're coming with you. 
And God then moves with the people, not just for a month or two or three, but he will sustain his people till he finishes his purpose. And that's what we want. We're not here for the 100-yard dash. We're here for the marathon to keep moving until the waters, as the waters cover the earth, the knowledge of the glory covers the earth. We want to see God's purposes fulfilled. So Genesis 7, two, twofold thing happening. Outpouring from above and a release from the depths of the end. In other words, our focus is not just, Lord, let it just pour out of heaven and we get caught up in heavenly experiences, although that's an inevitable outcome. I believe there's even a deeper longing. Lord, I want to understand deep within my heart who you are and what you're doing and why you're doing it. As well as enjoying the experience of it, as well as encountering the glory of what you're doing, I want to have an understanding. And the greatest understanding in, 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 in my own thoughts and maybe yours as well is, Lord, I want to know how you feel about things. I want to know your heart. Father God, I want to know how you really feel because that's the depth of intimacy when you can understand the heart of another. When you can say, I know where you're coming from. I think I know what you're feeling. I think I know what you meant by that. Without a knowledge of the Father's heart, we will be like the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were extremely religious. They were incredibly prayerful. They'd learned how to fast and have all the outward form of religion. They were entrusted with the prophetic word of the prophets of old. They began to speak the oracles of God. They were doing things openly and publicly for all men to see why we are so holy and so wonderful. And Jesus found them intolerable. In common lingo, he couldn't handle them. That seems utterly ridiculous. I would have thought he'd been drawn to them, praying and fasting and putting their flesh down and being pious in front of everybody. I thought that would attract the Lord. It repulses him. Well, then what attracts the Lord? How does he feel about all these things? And when you know the heart of God, you find a very different heart than what maybe religion portrays. And so it's for me personally to, to have revival but to sustain and live in revival for all the days of my life. It's to know the Father's heart and then to move with him. And so we have to have that understanding of how God feels. Ephesians 1, we won't read that prayer, but the prayer is, Lord, that the eyes of my heart would be enlightened so that I might know what's happening. The hope of the calling, uh, an understanding of the greatness of your power, an understanding of the riches of the glory, that they're all things we need to know and understand. And the eyes need to be focused on the heart of God so that we know what's happening. I, I feel it needs to be a passion, consuming passion of the Father's heart. Someone once said that true discernment is to know how the Lord feels about the matter. Most people who, who talk about discernment often mix it with judgment and they weigh it up in their own thoughts and according to their own understanding and experience and say, well, they make a judgment thinking that it's a discernment. The discernment is, God, what's your heart feeling about this situation? But if you don't know the Father's heart, you'll never discern, you'll only ever judge. You'll just make a judgment. And judgment is not good because in the measure we judge and in the kind of judgment we judge, it comes back upon us. We release a force which actually comes back upon us and we're judged in the same way. That's a motivation not to judge. It's a very strong motivation in my heart not to judge because it comes right back on me. And in the same measure and in the same area that I've judged, judgment comes back upon me. Do you reckon that's a good reason to stop? <laughs> it's an excellent reason to stop judging. The only thing we can judge is judge ourselves in the light of the word, so look at the measure of the standard of Christ and then we know where we're at in that way. But discernment is what's needed. How do you feel about it? I remember years ago visiting a young man in prison and he was you know, in a very distressed state because he'd done some, some difficult, major stuff and he was in a difficult situation. And I remember other people saying, well, you don't really want to spend much time. That person's really got done bad things and whatever. But in my own heart, I used to actually visit what was in an adult body, a child who felt was about 10. And it wasn't because I was trying to work it out. I, I think maybe I caught the father's heart for this person. And the father's heart was not to go and look at all the outward deed. The father's heart was let's look at the inward need and let's find out why the situation is as it is. And I found myself again and again praying for a child, not overtly and not in a way that they'd recognise that, but I was praying for the healing of the wounds. 
I was praying out for the binding up of the offences that had taken place, the removal of the abuse that was upon that life so that life can be lived differently in the future. But you see, if you come with a judgement, immediately you look at the outward deed, you make your mind up and then that's it. Generally, you don't want to go any further. But that's not how the Father feels. The Father loves looking at the need so that he can meet that need and the outward deed's already been judged in Jesus. Jesus paid the price for all outward sin. Amen. He became sin. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that through him the world might be saved. So an understanding of how the Father feels is going to either cause revival to be sustained in our midst, hearts, homes, um, church life, or God will move away from us. He'll allow us to experience an outpouring because an outpouring comes upon all. An outpouring comes upon you know those who deserve it, those who don't deserve it. He has mercy on those who deserve mercy or those who don't deserve mercy. When an outpouring comes, everyone gets wet. Hallelujah. So there'll be massive meetings, uh, city-wide meetings, where there'll be great outpourings of the Holy Spirit and everyone will experience, to some measure, God. Those who are present and those who have got some openness. But not everyone will continue to move with God. Not everyone will contain the presence and carry the presence of God. Well, who are the ones who are going to carry uh, the presence of God? Those who know the heart of God and whose hearts are one with God. Those who are feeling what God's feeling. I entrust them with what I'm doing. I'll give them more and more and more and more. So they represent me clearly. That's the problem with this pharisaical spirit. It does not represent the Lord clearly or accurately. It has the same words but the wrong spirit. And that's why Jesus had to say, you don't even know what spirit you're of. Now imagine him walking into this meeting today, as he has, and speaking to all of us to discern what kind of spirit we're in. And we'd all say, well, we're Christians. We do everything in the Holy Spirit. You know what? We don't. Sometimes we move beyond the frame of God and the heart of God and we start making judgments. And he says, you don't even know what spirit you're moving in. And so the fruit of it is chaos, disorder and things out of place. The fruit of when God moves is there's divine order, there's divine alignment and there's things being put in place. Christ is the head, we is the body. So I want to see revival sustained in my heart. I want to see it fulfil its course in the city. Anyone? Amen. Amen. But our hearts need to be right. As I said, the Pharisees loved the scripture. They practised outward godly morality, they honoured the Sabbath, they tithed their money, their produce, they prayed faithfully. God entrusted them the word, the prophetic word. They had this outward you know, appearance of holiness uh, but they misinterpreted and they misapplied everything they knew. They knew a lot, they just didn't present it truly and accurately. I think find that's a bit of a worry. So uh, Jesus says to them in John's Gospel, you don't know what kind of spirit you're on. So we need to understand the true heart of God. Matthew 11 is a great key, of course, through Jesus. Let's look at this this together this morning, Matthew 11. Now Jesus is fully God when he came on the earth in the form of a man, fully man, fully God. And uh, Philip said to Jesus, we want to see the Father What did Jesus say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Complete, accurate representation of who God was in Jesus Christ. And here in Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come unto me, all that are labour and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, you shall find rest to your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Just in those three verses we get an incredible insight into the heart of the Father. And the first thing the Father says, he says, number one, I want you. The love that draws us to him, the love that's aggressed towards us in Jesus, but now draws us back to him by the Spirit. That's the first thing is you and I wanted. Come to me, he said, come to me. Secondly, he says, because I'm gentle. And my translation says lowly. Um, lowly, is it? Sorry. I'm meek, sorry, meek. Yeah, gentle. Some translations have that as gentle. The word gentle, when we looked it up, it means one who's easy to get on with. I've never related that with gentleness. I mean, I like gentleness, but I've never understood it actually meant easily entreated, very reasonable about things, very easy to get on with. That's the heart of God. 
You know, God is easy to get on with. God is not difficult to get on with. We make out he's difficult because sometimes we transgress his law and then we make out he's got the problem. He's perfect. Or Hamatia, we miss the mark when we sin, we miss the mark when you aim but we missed it and then we get all cranky with God because the rules are too tight or something. God is actually the one who's the good fella. And I know we say it, but do, do we really believe it? Is God good? Is God good all the time? All the time is God good? I know it's easy to say yes, but deep in our heart when we're in trial and pressure and difficulty and sickness and distress, is God good at that moment? Absolutely. No change, no varying, no degree of change in his heart. He's good all the time. Now, you can't approach him willingly if you didn't think he's good all the time. I wouldn't. I'd go find someone who's good. But because God himself is the source of all goodness, then we go straight to God and we find that his uh, heart is towards us. Gentleness, pleasant, easy to get on with, friendly. I love that. And secondly, um, lowly, humble. And uh, the definition of being humble is to stoop low, make oneself low, to stoop down. And uh, the heart of God is that he stoops down to where we're at so that in due time he can exalt us to where we're meant to be. And of course that's the picture of salvation when God saw the sinful condition of man. He actually came down, stooped down and became that sin. Now you, ca- you can't get any dirtier than becoming sin. You know, a holy God got himself thoroughly dirty when he cared for you and me. He came down, took all the rubbish, the filth and the muck, put it upon himself, not just as an outward garment, almost like an inherent nature. He said, I take that entire sin nature, I put it on myself and I clothe you with a gift of righteousness and an abundance of grace. I find that thrilling beyond words, thrilling beyond words. If you've mucked around in the dirt in life, and I have, and you find someone stoops down so low and says, I'm going to take all of that upon myself and you're going to get all that I have upon yourself and it will never change. That blows my mind. It blows my mind. It's not just a doctrine. It's an experience that goes to the depth of your being that forever, according to John 15, we are clean. By the word that's been spoken, it's pronounced, you are clean. And if you have that in your heart, then the righteous man always approaches God. The righteous man comes boldly to the throne of grace. The righteous man, he prays up a storm knowing he's going to get exactly what he asks for, for he's found favour with God. I'm wrapped. I think we should go home. We've had a wonderful time this morning (laughs) because that's the most profound truth that I could possibly ever give you. Jesus became sin. You and I became righteous and we started to live like we were created to live. So the nature of the Father, according to even that one verse, he is gentle, pleasant, friendly, easy to get on with, thoroughly reasonable, fully able to be entreated on any matter. Secondly, he's humble. No pride, no arrogance. He comes right down to where we're at, even the level of our understanding. And by the anointing, he then leads us into more truth, line upon line or truth. He never chastises us, condemns us in the sense of making us feel unworthy. He always comes with view of exalting us in due season. Wonderful thing about God. Marvellous. So he bases himself, gets dirty so you and I can be clean and be lifted high as a showpiece. You know, we are the showpiece of God. The church is going to be unveiled in all of its glory. The reason why we're a hidden people is because we're still at the quarry. The book of Jeremiah says he's got his people at the quarry and he's using his word and he's chipping us away and he's getting off the rough spots and occasionally I think he's going... But anyway, he's working, his word's working, he's shaping us into the image of Jesus and when the church is in that place of glory, have a guess what happens? He just unveils it as a glorious trophy. And the whole world says, where did these people come from? the full manifestation of God's children. Where have they come from? Well, we've been preparing ourselves. We've been getting ourselves ready. wasn't always pleasant. wasn't always easy. But we invested our lives in, like today, the further step of yieldedness so that I might be like you, Jesus. But it won't be long before the church is unveiled in power and glory. 
The reason God hasn't done it fully is when the world sees us in a fallen state or semi-fallen state or an unfinished state, they're not as attracted as they will be. Do you know that the uh, the world is watching the church? People say, no, they're not interested. They're very interested. They don't get it, but they get it. John 17, when they see that you love one another, they will know you have the truth. The fact that they will see means they're going to be watching. Do you know your neighbours know you're in church this morning? You Maybe one of them will think, wonder what good that's going to do them. <laughs> maybe on Monday they're going to say, oh, I'll test to see whether they're getting changed from being a rat bag to a nice person. I mean, I wonder sometimes how the devil plans things to test us, especially with family members. They know darn well where we are this morning. I can hear them mocking and laughing from way back there. But it's all right because we're investing ourselves in being changed into the image of Jesus. We're going to be unveiled in all the glory of God. We won't be fully perfected until we see Jesus. (laughs) Someone's happy. But we are going to be seen to be like Christ. And the reason why that's important is the Great Commission is go and make disciples of the nations but the making of disciples, by definition in the Greek language, get hold of this one, the making of disciple equals the creating of duplicates. So when you make a disciple, you create a duplicate. The problem is this. If the prototype is unfinished, the duplicate is going to be the same. So people come flooding into the body of Christ. We're still biting and fighting. And they're going, oh, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what I want. I'm already miserable. I don't want to go where there's more misery. Strife, contention, division. Well, we'll get rid of most of that, but occasionally those things start to rise up. But when the church walks in the glory, and that means that we see Christ in the midst, we focus on Christ within, we don't look at earthen vessels, we're not worried about the unfinished aspects of our lives, we're looking to him, being changed by him from glory to glory, by the same Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3.18, then we will become gentle. Well, what's gentle? Easily entreated, thoroughly reasonable, pleasant. Now, wouldn't that be a wonderful change? Pleasant. And, uh, you know, friends who say the word nice, they don't like it, they feel it's like it's such a wishy-washy nice. But, you know, better than not being nice, I suppose, isn't it? Such nice people. Well, you know, that'll go a long way in a world that only knows corruption and destruction, that only knows the language of warfare. It'll be rather nice to meet kind people, decent people, reasonable people, easily be entreated, who are not going to be condemning, judging and hurting them, offering to heal and reconcile and deliver them. Don't you reckon that we might actually eventually become attractive? (laughs) Once God unveils the church... Once God unveils the church and he's about to unveil the church because the word of God tells us he's coming back for a glorious church. He's coming back for a church that's resolved their major issues and are dealing now on the, on the attitudinal stuff, dealing on the minor thing, getting it sorted out and then he will allow us to be seen. Hallelujah, that's wonderful. No one's happy but me. I think it's wonderful. So we will be humble, we will be gentle, we will be motivated by love. Now, the reason I've said all that as a background for this is that it's important for you and me, here we're moving into a second 10-year decade of ministry, (laughs) not suggesting you've got to be here for the next 10 years, but some of us probably will be. But even if we're here for another month, that we would be motivated by a force that will cause us to be cohesive and to be one unit, and that force, of course, is love. And when we realise that without love we haven't got true authority, it motivates some of us to get back to learning how to love God and love people. Authority without love is control. The strongest spirit still working under the, the stronghold of religion is the control spirit. Works with Jezebel, works with these forces that keep things controlled. And it's very, very common and it's, it stops the flowing of the Holy Spirit and it quenches the anointing every single time. It's the same Antichrist force that's been on the earth ever since. Uh, right in the early scriptures it says Antichrist is amongst you, not embodied in the person, but the spirit of it. And that, that's the spirit that comes in, even into Christian meetings, and stops the anointing. Yeah? Antichrist is Antichristos. Christos is the anointed one. Anti the anointed one. Anti the anointing. 
of that one. You can get away with everything else but as soon as the Holy Spirit starts to move that spirit will start to clamp things down. Let it not be so amongst us. Let the, let the river run its course. Let the Holy Spirit just keep being the one who is sovereignly in control. Where the Spirit is the Lord, there's, there's freedom and liberty. Liberty is not an occasion for the flesh. Liberty is I'm free to follow what God's saying. I'm free to obey. So in Ezekiel 36, if we can look at that, just a few scriptures this morning. I'm asking God to write this into my heart and to your heart this morning. Um, where's Ezekiel got to? Ezekiel 36. And it's talking about a phenomenon which we're seeing more and more in our time and our, our, our day. And that is the congregation, uh, congregating of people into major cities around the world. Of course, when scriptures were written, people were living that sort of agrarian lifestyle and people were in villages and towns and most people were not in cities. But it talks about a day when cities will become so important to God. Ezekiel 36, verse 33. Ezekiel 36, 33. Thus says the Lord God, In the day that I shall have cleansed you from your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities and the wastes shall be built and the desolate land shall be tilled whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden and the waste and the desolate and the ruined cities have become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build ruined places and plant that which was desolate. Now I'm the Lord who speak it and I'll do it. Now, if you look at the statistics about how we're distributed on the earth as a people, uh, most people live in cities. Most people are congregating into cities and it's still a phenomena that people are still leaving country areas and heading to cities all around the world. And part of it is because God's purpose to do something where there are the majority of inhabitants, because he loves everybody, so if most people are in cities, he's going to do something in cities. And in that city it says he's going to cause that which was desolate to be now tilled and to be fruitful, that which was ruined now to be built up, that which was a waste to now have a purpose and function. Which is the very reason why if we don't have the Father's heart for a city, then we're not any good in that city. It might look like we live like the rest of the world lives and you know we're good citizens, but if you and I don't love the city of Perth, maybe God's about to transfer you out because God requires, especially as believers, you love your city because if you love your city, then you'll pray for your city and my righteous blessing will be upon the city but if you don't love your city and you still pray for the city, you'll be released into witchcraft. Your thoughts, your feelings, your attitudes, your desires, your purpose, your jealousies, your angers and you will become an obstruction to my purposes. You either move, you know, what spirit are you of? Or where of the Holy Spirit? Easily be entreated, reasonable, always good, gentle, lowly, loving. That's the Holy Spirit revealed through, uh, the, the, sorry, that's the Father's heart revealed through Jesus. There is no other. There's no option saying, well, yeah, well, he is like that, but I prefer this. That's, ru- that's rubbish. We who are in Christ have to be like this. We are conformed to his image. We ought to be the most reasonable people in the city. We ought to be the best citizens of the city. We, we, we ought to be easily entreated in our neighbourhood. We should be the inverted commas, neighbourhood watch people, not as in the man's program, but in the spirit. We should be the kindest, most gentle, caring, etc. Because God intends to do something in our city, only if you love the city. And I could apply that for the 10 years of ministry that are now we've embarked on without walls. If you don't love without walls, you're not going to be an effective member of without walls. And I'm not saying love it because it's perfect. Well, it was till you joined. <laughs> but I'm saying oh, we love it because God has done something in my heart to put a burden on my heart and it's the burden of the heart that makes me love. I don't love it because it suits me. I mean, we're not kindergarten people. We don't do things because, it, well, it's really just because it suits me. We used to be like that. I don't think we're like that anymore. Are we? Well, not completely, occasionally. Two degrees in the morning, you don't always want to get up and go to church and so on, but generally we're pretty easily to be entreated. The Lord's dealing with me severely on it. He says, son, you, you need to have my burden in your heart before you do anything. Otherwise, what kind of spirit are you doing it in? Well, I've got to do it because I have to do it. 
Well, that's, that's charming. What a blessing that's going to be to the people. And I've got to go to prayer meeting because I've got to go to prayer meeting. Well, you got walking in that spirit, the whole prayer meeting's dead as a doornail because you walked in. So you've got to have a burden from God in your heart. And you and I are burden bearers. We know how to get burdens from God. But you know what else we, we're good at? Flicking it off as quick as it came on by not focusing on it and getting the mind to say, oh, you know, that's just me. The burden of the Lord is one of the most important principles of Scripture. And because you and I have Christ, we have to have the burden of how God feels about things or else we're not going to be effective. Otherwise, we have our own set of religious exercises. This is our pattern. We meet first and third, because second and fourth, we're asking God to show us how to be in small groups and how to be effective in marketplace. I mean, we could have this kind of pattern with the wrong heart. You could have another pattern and you'd, you'd be surprised how much pressure we, we get to say church every Sunday. A lot of people want it. But then I ask myself and I would ask the people the same thing. Why? Is that the burden of the Lord? Is that in fact really what God is saying in terms of forming the vision for this people? We can only go by what God puts in the heart. Or otherwise you copy this thing but it doesn't produce the right fruit unless it's the Lord. If it's the Lord, of course you do it. Always, ever. But the pattern is a bit different because that's the kind of burden. Now, it's not convenient. You know why? You don't get any tithes on the second or the fourth. And you don't get any giving. But have a guess what? Everything still costs. So you go back to the Lord, who's very easily to be entreated, remember, and Jeanette and I, well, Lord, we need to have a little chat about this. You've given us a pattern. We've got the burden. We're prepared to do it. But you have to put that burden in everyone's heart. Otherwise, we can't do this thing called ministry. And if you and I are open before God, read the burden of the heart. What is it in the heart? In the heart, not in the head. Not what she said, not what he wants, not what you read. What is it, God, that you require of me? Because that's the only thing you and I will be rewarded on, the very thing God's asked us to do. You and I won't have to give any account of what we were not asked to do. The only account before God is... With the purpose of being rewarded, nothing about judgment, nothing about losing salvation, the only thing you and I are still to have in terms of standing before God is, is the rewards. It's going to be a fabulous day. Because you imagine having all the blessings of God on the earth and then this fear I've got to stand before God and get told off. That would be awful. It's not going to be like that. Not for us. Hallelujah, not for us. There's no fear in love. We stand before the Father who gives out goodies. And says, here's your rewards, here's your blessings because I've made a judgment on all that I've asked you to do and in the measure that you did what you were asked to do, here's the reward. Whatever was gold, silver, precious stone, here's the blessing. And I'm sure a cuddle and a kiss will go on and we'll all be happy and thrilled and then we'll move into eternal purposes in God. Hallelujah. What a great day. Oh, some people say, oh, yeah, whatever. No, 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 not whatever. In the measure of what we're doing now and obedience to the burden of God c- carries a weight for eternity. And it's the very foundation of the reward system of God. It's an eternal reward system. Do not be casual with it. Don't say, oh, yeah, whatever. No, 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 not whatever. You will stand and give an account of the whatevers. Not in a negative way about the rewards. And I don't want to get a little green balloon with a hole in it. Son, this is your reward. Have fun trying to blow that thing up. Well, I got a present, but it wasn't what I thought I'd get. I know it's, that's pretty carnal in my thinking. But you know what? You, you and I can save a city and get a great reward. It's, not, it's not, not fleshly thinking. It's just biblical principle. Scripture says this poor man cried out to God and God gave him the city. Hallelujah. So when he walks in before God, and God looks at his account and says, you saved that city. Your reward is great. Don't you think that's reasonable motivation to keep getting it right? Yeah, absolutely. Don't treat this as if, oh, whatever. The whatever is not a doctrine in the Christian faith. It'll pan out. Someone says, I've got the pan theory. It just all pans out. No, 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 no. We've got an informed faith that tells us what you and I do now is commensurate to what happens for eternity in the degree of the blessing and the entrusting of work in eternity. And yet at the same time, everyone will be fully and completely happy in eternity because the capacity that we have will be filled with the reward of God. So 
So I think we should increase our capacity now. Lord, increase the burden. Stretch the borders of my habitation. Give me more, God. Give me, give me ten times what I'm already doing. Open up new doors now, Lord. I'm ready. Let's go, God. It's the capacity of your heart to respond more to God that causes a greater satisfaction in eternity. So there'll be no misery in heaven. Even the person who got saved the day before lived the life of an absolute rascal all the day of his life, gets into heaven, will be 100% fully blessed in eternity. But their capacity to serve and do all that God would perhaps have planned for their life, maybe they never reached. But they are still full with their capacity and their heart's capacity before their loving God to forever be happy. So that's good. Like the thief on the cross, this day, this day you'll be with me. Remember Jesus said, this day you'll be in paradise. Paradise was not opened up as heaven. Paradise was a compartment under the earth. When Jesus descended to hell, he actually it was in paradise there. And there was, of course, Sheol, which was the depths of the hatred and darkness of hell. But there's a compartment of hell where the Old Testament saints were being kept until Jesus was raised from the dead. Did you know that? That was called paradise. Otherwise, Jesus couldn't say, this day you'll be in paradise when three days he's going to be under the earth. Where's that poor guy for the last three days? No, that poor guy is a blessed guy. He's with Jesus in paradise until the finished work of hell had been done. He'd conquered death and hell. He rose from the dead. The first thing he did, he opened up paradise and took all the saints with him. And all the Old Testament saints who were in that, in that compartment, they weren't in hell, they were in paradise, but it was under the earth. They had a great procession in the spirit realm. And as he took them out of the compartment of paradise, he gave gifts to the church. He deposited, as he was leaving the earth, he poured out gifts of the Spirit and apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. All that the church would need to mature was given to the church. I didn't mean to go on this tack, but I'm on it, so I'm just sort of sailing down a river somewhere there. Hallelujah. I mean, it's good news. And that causes us to be motivated. Lord, I love this. When I think of without walls, I don't think of all the unfinished business, of which there is much. (laughs) I don't think all the issues of which there is much. I don't think of all the problems of which there are much. There are as many problems that we have people in the church. In case you think, I wonder what sort of problem he's thinking of. I'm talking about human beings, including two of us who help lead. But I don't focus on that. I focus on the burden that God's put in our heart, knowing that if you do the burden, you'll get the anointing to do the work and God will sort out the problems. If you build my house, I'll build your house. That's how it works with God. And so a love for the city, a love for the church, a love for the family, a love for the whatever it is in life that you've got a burden for. The love is going to be the key because the love, according to Ezekiel 36, brings the healing, the deliverance, the restoration and the revival. It's love. Control spirits can't do that. They have a semblance of order but there's no life. Luke 19, a couple more scriptures. Are you with me this morning? Will you still be with me this afternoon? Or we're almost there. Luke 19, a couple more scriptures. Wow, Jesus. I want that same spirit that hit the Anglicans on Friday to hit us tonight, this morning. Anyone happy with that? I mean, they spoke in tongues. I mean, they were being slain in the spirit. They were coughing up demons. They were shaken under the power. They were having visions. Hallelujah. One lady fell asleep. It's not a bad proportion. I've more fallen asleep in these meetings. Luke chapter 19, 41, pretending to be in the spirit. <laughs> Luke 19, when he was come near, he, say it with me, he beheld. What did Jesus look at? He beheld and he wept. And he said, if thou hadst known even now, the least, at least in this day, the thing which belong unto thy peace. In other words, you, you don't even get a burden of what this is all about but now they're hid from your eyes. For the days shall come, enemies shall cast a trench about you, compass you about, keep you on every side. They shall lay even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem because they did not understand his burden for that city or the destiny of that city or what was about to happen to that city. The invasion of Rome. They didn't understand what was about to happen. The problem with the church today is this. A whole lot of people don't have any idea what's about to happen. Do you know we're about to go into some really rough times? Even though the glory's come, 
even though the, the revival has come, there's a parallel revival taking place, an outpouring of filth like we've never seen before, based on the parable of Matthew 13 when Jesus said in the last day the angels will be released and the angels will begin to bring in the harvest of both good and evil. Two revivals simultaneously. The revival of the church rising up to the tremendous apex of resurrection power. I mean, it's happening, it's starting. It's going to absolutely be greater than Acts chapter 2 and the early revival of 3, 4, 5, chapter 6 of, of Acts. Greater than that. But at the same time, there's a world revival of the negative, all the filth, all the rubbish, all the, all the curses that have been released, all gathered in, all the fruit of it's been gathered in in one season. Because some people say, oh, things have always been bad. I said, they've never been bad and accepted and called good. There's always been bad stuff, but it's never sort of seemed to be brought into a harvest and then pronounced good. It's always been recognised by decent people that it's bad. Now bad is good, white is black, black is white. Uh, Christians are the offenders because they're narrow-minded bigots. They're going to cause problems in the world, so what we'll have to do is to shut them up and accept everything and everyone else. This is the season we're in. It doesn't matter if you like it or not, it's the season we're in. When God came to Nehemiah and put a burden on his heart, Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. Now we've had a prophetic word from Kerry Kirkwood that you and I would be like the king's cupbearer in the sense that we would test things in the word and the spirit before we allow them to hit the city. It's not maybe not just us, I'm sure there are many, but we would have a function like the king's cupbearer where the cupbearer had to check that that drink that was about to be given to the king was pure, undefiled, there was no poison that someone had sort of, you know, wasn't spiked in our language. The cupbearer had to make sure that what was presented to the king was absolutely pure. That was his function. That's the function of the body of Christ. That what comes into the city is pure. What comes in is clean. But we, we've been so far behind the eight ball, the avalanche of filth's already hit us. And it's come in the guise of multiculturalism. I'm not against that, that God's intention with that, but I'm, in, I'm against what the Spirit's done with that, where every foreign God's been allowed to come in and manifest and be treated with more respect than the Lord Jesus Christ. Cindy Jacobs walked into the city of Perth and she said this, this city and this nation will give more respect to Islam than they will give to Christianity. And I deep in my heart was saying, I hope she's wrong, 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 knowing she was right. A, because she's a prophetess. This city, this nation will give more respect to Islam than Christianity. At that stage that hadn't happened. It had, had in the spiritual seed form, but now that seed has grown, it's been watered, it's been placated, we bow down to it, we're too scared to offend it, we don't address it, we don't question it, and it's devouring. So what's God going to do? He says, well, you're the king's cupbearer. What are you going to do? Well, number one, we're going to catch the burden of God as to how he feels about things and not play games and call it church and have little, little soft little meetings where no one gets offended. Let's offend the devil in us. Let's absolutely confront the darkness that tries to hold on to our lives. Let's smash the lies and the deception that have almost killed us. What game is it? Well, it's not a game at all. It's the eternal destiny. So Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer and he was in the palace and he was incredibly well provided for. You check this out, Nehemiah 2, 3, 4. And he was an honourable man. Burden of the Lord comes when he hears that Jerusalem, the beloved city of God, was now burned. You see the, the words of Jesus? You don't know what's going to happen. I'm, I've got the burden. I'm weeping over what's about to happen, the destruction of Jerusalem. Anyway, it happened, took place, and Nehemiah hears Jerusalem's burned, the gates have been removed and burned, the whole thing's like a desolate wasteland. And what does he go? Oh yeah, well, did these things happen? No. It broke his heart. It broke his heart. And the burden was so strong, he went to the king and he said, I've got to do something about that city. I've got to do something about that city. And he found favour with the king. And the king gave him a letter to say, I'll help you and I'll fund it and I'll support you because the burden is so deep for your city, your roots of, uh, of Judaism, the knowledge of God. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to support that. You know there are rich men in this city who support the cause of Christ if someone has the nerve to rise up and ask. If someone says we're sick of... Like this movie. This, this is not a nothing movie. This is we want an ambassador from this nation who will stand with all the ambassadors to other nations who is against human trafficking and speaks on behalf of those who can't speak. 
It, it's not a, it is a movie, but it's far more than a movie. Praise God that every Christian would rise up and say, right, enough's enough. Number two, if you'll do it, the burden of the Lord will come upon you and the anointing will be there to do it. Now here's the problem. Between the vision of what God wants in your heart for without walls, 10 years, whatever, for the city of Perth, for your house church, for your work situation, the difference and the time frame between the vision, yeah, got the vision, yep, got the vision, awesome, got the little booklet last week, yeah, yeah, car, thank you Jesus, got the vision, between the vision and the provision is Third World War. There's a problem. What's the problem going to be? Well, according to Nehemiah, the devil got hold of, you know, Sambalat, he got hold of Tobias, he got hold of religious people who had no heart. They didn't have a heart for Jerusalem and they opposed this man coming in to do some work of restoration of the desolation and they fought him tooth and nail and they mocked him and they talked about him and they gave bad reports about him. I don't know whether everyone wants to actually go from vision to where it's actually fully provided for because not everyone wants to go through the warfare. I know people who've had vision for 30 years and haven't taken one step from just holding the piece of paper. This is my vision. Awesome. Sit in the naughty corner. You're supposed to do the vision. You're supposed to do the vision. You're supposed to work towards it, walk towards it. You're supposed to conquer the giants. I'm not trying to be mean this morning, but something's coming on me this morning. I believe in it's going to be... I believe it's God... He's probably speaking to me as well. Do it. Just get up and do it. That's the sense I'm feeling in my own spirit. There are things I want to do in this city. I tell you, there are things I want to do in this city. Can I say it again? There are things I want to do in this city. There are things I want to do in this city. That will not look like church. That's what I want to do. I want to do this as well. But this is just an equipping of you to do what the vision is in your heart. This is what is the burden in your heart. But if we don't love the ministry, you know, in all due respect, I'm not telling you to go elsewhere, but what I'm saying is go elsewhere. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is without, without the burden, without an... <laughs> Otherwise we'll irritate you. Something will annoy you. There'll always be something that's not right when the vision's not there. But when the burden of God's there, you'll, be, you'll see through it. You'll see through the eyes of the heart. And you say, I don't care what comes against us. This is so deep in me, I will do it. And Nehemiah forever will be remembered as the one who rebuilt. And he said to the people, three words, arise and build. And he said to the people, next time he met them, three words, arise and build. And the anointing, the burden was so great, the anointing came on the people. It says they all worked willingly. And that's got to be the biggest miracle in biblical history. Everybody worked willingly. I mean, they're happy, happy canters. Everyone's smiling as they're at the prayer meeting and saying, I'll do it, Phil, we'll, we'll join you, man. Willingly. That can only come not by coercion. It can never come by outward control. It can only come by inner revelation. Ah, God, a burden. Ah, God, a burden. I want to connect. I want to help. I want to support. I want to love the city. I want to save my generation. It's got to come from God. And it says that regardless of all the opposition, all the slander, all the rubbish, I mean, I had it all down in notes, but I sort of didn't quite go that way this morning. And, and apart from all the resistance, all the persecution, Nehemiah just kept his course. He kept his course and he persevered. Tremendous attitude of perseverance. And I wonder this morning whether you and I will persevere with our families. When it gets tough, is, it, is that the option, option of, oh, well, I'm out of here? It is for 50% even in Christian marriages. Oh, it's all getting a bit hard, you know. Life's too short to worry about it. Is it an attitude we have with our kids? Oh, well, we've lost the kids. Oh, well, that's it. We did our best, you know, whatever. Neighbours? Oh, yuck, (laughs) neighbours. Local school? Oh, those kids make so much noise. Pain in the neck. The local teenagers? Oh, a bunch of rat tags. That kind of attitude does not heal a city. That kind of attitude leaves it desolate. It leaves it as a wasteland. There's no fruit that comes forth. But an attitude of God, I know there's a cost. I mean, I was a king's cupbearer. I was in a palace. 
now I'm sitting in a bunch of ruins because that's where Nehemiah found himself for a long time, sitting amongst ruins, charred bits of wood and broken bricks. That was his home. Now people say to me, well, that can't be God. He's not going to move me from a palace to a, to a desolate... You know what? If the burden says that's what you have to go through to get to where God wants you, that's exactly where you have to go. And whatever state I find myself, I've learned to be content. I'm not aiming to go live in a rubbish dump. But if in the process of going from glory to glory, I'll get to pass through a valley, I'll go through it. If I have to pass through something that's dark and horrible, I'll go through it. You will go through it. You've been through it. We've been through things together. Even though spiritually it's glory to glory, in the natural, I went from the palace to the pit. What the heck? But in the, in the pit, I learned something that I could never learn in the palace. Hallelujah, Jesus. Again, the person next to you, if they're still there, <laughs> bless them. And say to them, vision to provision. Vision to provision. Say it with them, vision. vision. Say it to them, vision, vision. to provision. <laughs> but in the middle, uh-oh. <laughs> Say to them, in the middle, middle. uh-oh. Oh. A few tests. A few tests. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. The temptation in the season of uh-oh is drop the tools, change the church, change location, get out of the hot water and start again. But you know what happens? You start again with the same building material that you left behind before because that's who you are. And you and I need to be gentle, lowly. In other words, we just bow down to whatever's happening with, with absolute intention to exalt it. But you can't exalt it if you haven't got a hold of it. And thirdly, by love, always the key. Amen. We're blessed this morning. Thank you, Jesus. I declare over without walls the next 10 years, we're blessed in Jesus' name. Blessed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Declare over the city of Perth, you are a blessed city. You are still the city of light. You have a destiny to provide for the nations. You are rich in every resource from God. Rich in the natural is just a sign we're rich in the spirit. And here she comes. A microphone, microphone, just don't, don't say anything, don't mic, mic, mic. <laughs> microphone. Jenna, just give it to me. You almost haven't wanted at times, but here's the man. Here's the man for the city. Oh, take that mic back again. <laughs> he doesn't always want it because it's hard, but here's the man for the city. I had to get out of my seat and say, I know, I know that is from the heart of God. Hallelujah. Bless you, Paul. Bless you. I think you need an inbuilt one, though. No, 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 no. It's, it's, uh, if I hadn't said it, I would have let, let the whole of without walls down. I had to say it. A man for the city. Thank you, Jesus. That's right. Oh, that's right. Oh. Thank you, Jesus. What a character. But I'll tell you what, before you as a, as a testimony... Every time she opens her mouth, I'll listen. Every time she opens her mouth, I'll listen. I even tune in when she's talking to someone else. <laughs> you know why? She speaks truth unashamedly, no fear of man. She doesn't care less what the devil thinks. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I, th I think we should maybe finish by praying for each other. We're all gifted, we're all anointed. Just, just a couple of minutes, maybe for three, four, five together, if you stand little circles, I don't know how, but if anyone needs particular prayer for healing, whatever, you're welcome to come. Just pray for one another. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Amen, 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 amen. character.